time at NICE, and, uh, and you have a, a major important point, which is I'm not going to present data. I'm probably unlike anybody else who's appeared before you this quarter. Um, I'm a philosopher. I dabble in data the way any interested person might dabble in data. I try to know a bit about what's going on and what the basic facts are. But what I'm going to talk to you is about um, how we should respond to those facts. What ought we to do in the context of those facts? So I'll start with a few stylized facts just to get things going. But then I'm going to do something very different, which is what philosophers do. I'm going to try to identify the values that are at stake. I'm going to try to get clarity <coughs> on what the values are and talk about how we might think about trade-offs among values and how we might rank those values and how those values might bear on some of the facts that you've been looking at um, during this quarter. So I'll just start with a few striking and stylized um, data points just to fix the discussion. And I'm sure these are already very familiar to all of you. So um, here are three Three important facts. Um, in the United States, black students are almost twice as likely as white students to drop out of high school. This is 2011 data. While 28% of Americans over 25 have at least a four year college degree, the rate for black Americans is 17%. Black children enter the first grade with lower scores than their white counterparts, and the gaps widen with each additional year of schooling. So it's actually schooling doesn't um, reduce the gap. It actually uh, either is neutral or is uh, leading to the gap growing itself. Um, in math, the average African American eighth grader is performing at the 19th percentile of white students, and the average Hispanic student is at the 26th percentile. So here's a fat, bunch of facts about group based inequality. Okay, uh, looking, tracking. Uh, uh, racial and ethnic differences in student performance. Second, stylized facts. These are recent study by Susan Karski <coughs> and Martha Bailey at the University of Michigan found that the proportion of students from upper income families who earn a bachelor's degree has increased 18 percentage points over a 20 year period while the completion rate of poor students has grown by only 4% over that same period. And then third, a recent study by Sean Reardon, which I'm sure you've heard about, um, has looked at both the widening income gap, um, and now uh, by some measures greater than the um, race gap in achievement, but also Sean found in one of his studies that um, 15% of high income students from the high, school, the high school class of 2004 enrolled in very selective colleges, including colleges like Stanford, while only 2% of low income students do. So there are a bunch of statistics or data points about some group based inequalities in the United States. And so we are faced of that fact. And then the question is how should we respond to it? What should we think about the disparities in outcomes between members of different groups? And more generally, um, what principles should we use to guide our thinking and um, thinking about whether and how to redress this? So um, I'm going to start by talking about the fact that these are um, inequalities. So I want to talk about equality as a value. I want to try to get a little bit of a handle on what kind of value this is and how it differs from other values. And I'll start by making a, a bunch of um, obvious points. The first point, and the one that's relevant to the question of what we should do or how we should respond, is it's obvious that not all inequalities right, are morally objectionable. So there are inequalities between people. I'm shorter than lots of people in this room, but you might not think that the fact that some people are taller than me is by itself objectionable. So 
if inequalities are objectionable, they're usually objectionable for some other reason. There's something in virtue of which we think some difference in uh, some outcome or achievement or fact merits right a response um, and is objectionable, whereas some kinds of inequalities aren't. My students, for example, get different grades on they're writing their papers right now. I will not give every student in my class an A. Um, and I think it's perfectly legitimate for me to in different grades. And so we often think that some inequalities are legitimated by the fact that people perform differently, uh, um, uh, use different amounts of effort and choice in order to generate an outcome. So I just want to start with not every inequality is objectionable, but some all clearly are. And then the question is, what makes them objectionable, and how should, and then how do we understand them? And I'm going to start abstract, and then I'm going to move down to the level of education. So let me just say something very abstract about equality as a value. Um, and this may be obvious, but it's important to put it on the table. Equality is comparative. Right, so it, it, to say something is unequal is to say something A is unequal with respect to B. You can't be, this is Leibniz's law, you can't be unequal to yourself, everything's equal to itself. Right, so you're comparing two things and the inequality obtains between the things that you're comparing. So it's relative. It doesn't have to do with absolute levels. It's not looking at how much somebody has in itself, but it's looking at how much somebody has with respect to others. And that's a really important point, that inequality or equality as a value is um, uh, unspecific as opposed to level, right? So when we're talking about something being unequal or something being equal, we're not saying anything about at what level. And that means, and it should be obvious, that in the context of education, equality can't be the only value we care about. Because in the context of K-12 education or college education, we don't only care about the relative standing, we care about the absolute levels. Right? We actually care in the context of K-12 education and making sure students are educated to some level. The fact that they were all the same, but at a very, very low level, wouldn't be adequate for an education. No, no good education system would only care about assuring equality independent of level. So that's just a point about equality. It has to do with relative um, standing relative or comparison, and it is indifferent as to level. And it's important to get this point because a lot of times what people respond to and what could be at stake in some of the examples I gave at the very beginning, the stylized examples or many examples, isn't about relative differences, although it may be, and I'll argue it will, it is, but I'll come back to that. But there's another value that's often at stake that people can um, confuse with equality and I'll call that value, for lack of a better word, humanitarianism. Right? So sometimes we care about the absolute level of how people are faring. It's not a comparative judgment. It's that we think it's objectionable that some people um, fare really badly. So if I care about um, the, the, the starving or the extremely poor, in um, India, I might care about that irrespective of their relative standing with respect to others. Now, I might use the relative inequality as information, right? It tells me something, right? It tells me it doesn't have to be that way, and it tells me maybe a lot of people have a lot. That means that um, maybe <coughs> what they have could go to help some of the people who have less. So it's an information point, but it's a separate point from my concern. My concern might simply be that some people are really badly off. So there are two very different values. And sometimes 
the same kind of day or some differences um, are more evoke more humanitarian concerns in one context where if we move them into a different context they may evoke more egalitarian concerns and I'll give you an example of how I think you can't just look at the gaps but you have to look at the um, context of the gaps so here's a data point the average age in Malawi is 30, uh, the average life expectancy, sorry, in Malawi is currently 37. The current life expectancy in the US is, uh, it's going up, it's like in the high 70s. Um, that's a big gap. Now if you thought the only thing you cared about was the gap, then of course you might think let's, it would be a good thing if like they could bring the U.S. down and Malawi up a little bit. You might not think that, because maybe what you're thinking is, it's really a bad thing that people in Malawi only live to 37. If that's not a decent lifespan. And so what's pushing you is the humanitarian concern is what's uppermost in your mind. Now take the United States where the gap between white and black life expectancy is really on the order of about five years between the, you have to go by region, um, much smaller than the gap between white and black Americans than between Americans in general and Malawians. But you might think in the context of the United States, what matters or what, and we'll have to talk about why, but what matters is the gap and that you're more concerned there about the gap, and that bringing whites down to maybe bring the black Americans up would be a good thing, because maybe it would be a marker of something being more fair about society. So I'll talk about why that is, but I just want to say it's important to be clear whether it's <coughs> egalitarianism or egalitarianism that's motivating you, because you will respond differently and gaps that seem permissible or acceptable in one context because the driving force is humanitarian might suddenly become unacceptable in a context where the driving moral response is um, egalitarianism. So and stop me at any point um, if uh, your questions. Okay, so I'm going to talk a lot about different kinds of equality, but as I said, um, not only not all un inequalities <coughs> between people are objectionable, and it's rare that equality or inequality in itself matters. It usually matters for some reason. And I um, thought about what reasons that there might be for um, objecting to inequality. And I'm going to give you five. And maybe you can help me, because maybe I'm missing something that should be on the list. But I came up with five. And, um, and then we'll think about how these apply in the context of education. So why might an, an inequality between individuals or between groups be objectionable? Well, one reason is that some inequalities seem to be tied right, to status differences between people that we think are inappropriate. So we might think it's inappropriate right, in a democracy for some people to be the inferiors of other people. Right? Whatever differences there are between people, some people shouldn't be superiors and some people inferiors simply, um, let's say, by social origin or um, because of the way they're treated. And some kinds of inequalities either reflect or produce differences in status between people that would be <coughs> objectionable. So it's not the inequality in itself. Right, the difference between the 37-year-old life expectancy in Malawi and the 70-year-old uh, life expectancy in the U.S. might not reflect a difference in status. We can talk about that. But we might think that the differences in life expectancy between white and black Americans are symbols or causes or emblematic of a difference in status and the standing of people within a society. 
So that's one reason. We might care about inequalities. This is, I'm not going to make this quite a technical term, but I'll make it an untechnical term, domination. We might care about inequal some kinds of inequalities because they give some people unaccountable power over other people. So this wouldn't be, again, it's not an equality in itself. You could have differences in life expectancy or differences in income and wealth. But if the income and wealth differences didn't translate into differences in status and didn't give people, some people, unaccountable power over other people, or they might pass through. So what are the kinds of ways we might worry about inequalities leading for pe to people to have um, unaccountable or unacceptable power over others? Well, you can think about the debates about campaign finance, which have been very much about whether or not the fact that some people have more money to contribute to the political process ought to give them right, more opportunity to influence the outcomes of that process. So you might object right, to the inequalities of wealth, not because of inequality in itself, people just holding in, you know, different amounts of paper, money, is itself objectionable, because, but because it can translate in our society into unequal political power. Let's stay with inequality of income. That's a good one to talk about, because you might think what's objectionable about unequal income between people. Is it in itself objectionable? Hard to see why in itself it would be objectionable, but you might object to it because you thought it translated it into unequal status, as it might, again, politically, or because it led some people to have um, a kind of power over other people um, that uh, was um, not seen as legitimate. Okay, now I'm going to get closer to education, I think, although education is involved in these as well. So we care about the processes of our society and its institutions being fair. Um, so we might worry that some kinds of inequalities could undermine right, the fairness of the processes. So I said, I'm going to grade my students, and some of them are going to get A's. And because it's Stanford, maybe some of them will get B's. That will be the grade distribution. But um, you know, it'll be on the basis of their own efforts. And, but now imagine right, that because my students um, bring you know, have unequal amounts of money, and some of them start slipping me money, you know, to boost their grades. Well, we would worry about that because they would, we would think, look, the way, the fair way to assign grades is on the basis of merit. And so we might, when inequalities get too large, they might undermine the fairness of some of our procedures. And this brings us, of course, closer to education because if we think one of the ways that education, one of its goals, is to um, slot talented people into positions, um, we might worry <coughs> that uh, unequal amounts of money could undermine that slotting process um, because they slot inappropriate people into positions and they prevent people who would be appropriately slotted into positions from getting into those positions. So the Sean Reardon or the general studies that show that very few low-income students go to highly selective colleges, one reason you might be worried about that is because you think actually what it shows is that the, the game is rigged, right? There's not real fairness unless you think that all the untalented people are the poor. But if you don't believe that, then you're going to have a suspicion, and of course then we can also try to study that. So that's another reason people care about inequality. A fourth reason that you might care about, and this also relates to education, is, and I don't know how to <coughs> put this, this is connected to equal opportunity, I think. That's the idea that 
Um, in a society, all citizens are entitled to an equal benefit from whatever goods or services the government provides. Right? Maybe this is partly connected to the idea of equal status, but that it seems unfair or wrong if some citizens get a benefit from the state that other citizens are, are unable to, or, or um, uh, aren't able to get. Now, as I said, this has to be spelled out because it can't be literally equal benefit. It has to be something like the opportunity to achieve an equal benefit because, of course, people are different, and so they won't all be able to use what the state provides in the same way. But there's some idea that if some people are able to get favors from the state, I mean, you can easily think of this you know, in terms of laws that would um, uh, discriminate on the basis of law between people. We think that's a legitimate. But this <coughs> principle, I think, goes further and says, look, even beyond law, you know, if the state is providing an opportunity for people, the state should not be providing that opportunity unequally to people. Now, again, we have to think about what that means. This has to be unpacked, but that's a fourth reason you might care about inequalities, because you think they reflect an unequal benefit. And then I have a fifth reason, and this one, this is my more social science-y reason, mm -hmm. and it's more contingent, right, is that there's a whole literature, as many of you know, on what's the connection between inequality and efficiency or productivity. And some people have argued that um, the kinds of inequalities that we see in very unequal societies are actually a drain on efficiency, right, that you actually, because you're wasting a lot of talent and ability, the society is actually less productive than it could be. So that's a fifth more contingent because very debated reason. So am I missing something from the list that you think should be on the list? Now I said most of these are, um, uh, they're not about inequality in itself. They're about what um, and inequality is associated with. But I will say some kinds of inequality are in themselves unequal status. <laughs> you know, you don't need to like go out and look <laughs> and say, is this really unequal? There are some ways of treating people that I think just constitute unequal status. There are other ways of treating people that might lead to unequal status. So there's some forms of inequality that on their face, you know, seem in, you know, in itself unacceptable, but I think it's, again, always because they're marking um, one of these five reasons. But if you have a sixth or a seventh reason, I would love to hear it. Is there a, yeah? Yeah, I guess something along the lines of stability, you know, higher crime, less trust. <coughs> uh, where would that uh -huh. sort of fit in those? So that's a good, um, that's another contingent social science, uh, you know, so, um, now it could, you know, turn into s something connected to these because, of course, you know, when you're talking about like the breakdown of community, you might be talking about differences in status. But certainly, and I'll put my Rawlsian hat on here. <laughs> uh, Rawls makes a great deal of the stability of society. Of course, there's the stability for the right reasons, but that we ought to care about if a society, the community in a society, so breaks down. And that people have talked about extremes of inequality leading to a breakdown of social cohesion. Other, yeah? So I'm trying to capture way. some of that in the efficiency yeah, or you know, development, growth. Again, there's a I'm not a social scientist, so I don't have to resolve this. There's a big, you know, literature debating whether or not, you know, it would be nice. We always like to think all good things come together and that, you know, you can get your equality and your efficiency too. And of course, there's a famous um, 
uh, old set of arguments that argues there's always a trade-off um, between equality and efficiency. That was the standard view for a very long time. Who wrote the book? Uh, equity, what was it called? Arthur Oakham? Yes, right, the, big, the great trade-off. And now the received wisdom says, actually, maybe there isn't a trade-off. Maybe you actually get both, <coughs> but that's a, that's a debate I'm not gonna wade into. I'd be happy if it turned out you could get both. Other thoughts about mm -hmm. What about yeah. privilege? So I'm thinking about privilege as connected either to this issue of domination or of procedural fairness. I'm, not, I'm thinking about privilege just by virtue of what status you're born into or what what the dominion, domination is of the family that you come from. Unearned privilege. Okay. Giving you status. So that I yes. And that that's this category. That's what I meant I mean that to be standing for that. It's the idea that by birth or social origin or accident we are dividing people into inferiors or superiors, that, and that we object to inequalities when they do that. Right? So again, you could imagine a society in, in theory that had economic inequality between people, maybe even very extreme economic inequality. Now imagine a society you have the very wealthy spend all their money on votes. They spend none on their children's education. Right, they spend none on like racking up um, and hoarding opportunities for themselves. What they want to do is spend all their money on votes. So you have inequality, maybe there's some status in vote owning, but nobody really, you know, the people who don't own votes think it's all a waste of time. And, uh, so they, they don't dominate because they don't spend their money on politics. They don't undermine procedural fair. They don't spend their money on their kids. They don't spend their money trying to, you know, get political advantages. They don't even try to, like, they're happy to pay the taxes on the votes that they earn. They're not trying to really get, right? So you could imagine a society where there's a lot of inequality and it doesn't have these effects. It would be, a, you know, it's imagining because that's not the society we live in. And I think in general, very large inequalities in income and wealth tend to show up on this list in varying ways, and it's precisely because they show up that they're troubling. It's in virtue of these pieces, at least that's my argument, it's a, a, of these different factors that we care about inequality. Yeah? So I think every time, I, when I think of the discussions of inequality, I realize just even based on these six, everything is so linked to the material, mm -hmm. right? Power, resources, status, domination. But what about that which is non-material? What about the relational, the social psychological? And I saw something today, a study that shows that even our romantic ties are affected by by inequality in some way. How do you where would that fit? What would you call that? Because that's not I'm not I'm not thinking about cooperation and trust so much as that are we realizing the full potential of ourselves as human beings? <laughs> if inequality even shapes our romantic tastes or preferences or desires and who we choose as partners. So um, so I think it's an important point that Stated. even though inequalities can you know arise from differences in holdings and generally do material holdings, they have spillover effects that go way beyond the material holdings that people have. And they show up in, I mean, status is partly, you know, the idea that we're inferior or superior partly depends on how we treat each other and what attitudes we have. It doesn't, you know, it's not simply in virtue of the fact that people hold more resources. It's the fact that we we treat people better when they hold more resources. We respect them, we listen to them, we give them more authority. Um, we take their word. Um, so there are epi maybe epistemic effects of inequality. We know that there are epistemic effects of inequality, who we're likely to listen to or whose word counts. So I think that will all show up. This is not meant to be um, simply, it's about the effects of differences. Um, in uh, movable stuff, 
But the differences are themselves partly relational differences, right? Domination is not, again, you could imagine people holding different amounts of stuff, but it not leading to one person having unaccountable power over them. So, I, I mean, I, I want to underscore this. You don't have to accept this. You can come up with your own list or think this is, but I'm trying to at least argue that inequality in itself is rarely objectionable. It's, it's always, you know, when you object to it, you're generally objecting to it in virtue of something else. Um, and here's a list of things I think that are on the table for the main candidates that I think uh, call on your uh, moral response. Ken? Yeah. Uh, no, okay, if you want to move on. Then. No, okay. Well, I was just, um, it seems like, like something stakes fairness and, and inmate would be like another kind of story. <laughs> So you could have like, um, you know, you're born and then you flip a coin and if you lose the coin toss, you get nothing and if you win the coin toss, you get a lot. And you could have like a government system in place in which like status and domination are kind of maintained on an equal standing. Um, so like access to government is, you know, also by lottery and, and the workplace is a place where no one's dominated. But like the fact that I lost that coin toss and you won the coin toss and get to have a vote and I get to have, you know, my whatever I have. I would be I would be envious of your standing, even though the procedure was fair and all that kind of stuff was in place. Um, so I think you're raising uh, an important point. So procedural fairness is only one aspect of what's worrying about inequalities. So you could imagine a world where uh, positions were assigned, it's our world, except positions are assigned by coin toss. So, and you might say, that's a fair procedure, right? Everybody, this, you know, the, the coin is not weighted. Everybody flips that coin. The procedure is fair, at least, you know, the initial starting gate theory is in place. But you still might worry, because you think the shape of the positions, the inequality of the positions itself is tied to the fact to unequal status or the fact that some people can dominate each other. So even if I got into you know the, whatever position in the workplace by the coin flip, if I'm in the inferior position, I might still have reason to complain because the fairness of the procedure doesn't exhaust my reasons for being concerned about inequality. Some people think the only reason to care about inequality is about the procedure, and I'm going to come back to that, but this is a nice example to get you to think that maybe more is at stake than just the fairness of the procedure. Right. Did everybody see this? Because I think it's an important, and it's especially important because a lot of the way people think about equality of opportunity is they're thinking simply about the fairness of the procedure, and they're not thinking about, so Ken put it, um, uh, in, in terms that another philosopher's use about stakes, what the stakes are that attach to the positions that might be governed by fair equality of opportunity. So imagine, so we'll just for now say fair equality of opportunity, the fair chance, actually what do we fair, equal chance to get any position is all going to be determined by a coin. But you might think the stakes of being in one position or another. So imagine you're in, the, you know, you get into the bad position, and if you turn out to be in the bad position, you don't have access to health care, you don't have access to good neighborhoods, you don't have access to good schools, right? There are a lot, you might think, look, the fact that it's equal opportunity doesn't justify the structure of rewards. And again, that's a little bit like, as I was saying, Equality is indifferent as to level. We have a lot of reasons to care about the level. Equality of opportunity or equal chances is indifferent to what the structure is of rewards that attach to those equal chances. And we have a lot of reasons to be concerned of these kinds about the structure of rewards. And sometimes I think we spend too much time focusing on the equal opportunity piece and not enough uh, thinking about the structure of rewards that attach to being in different positions. But I'll come back to that. Yes? How about choice? Either the choices you make or are forced to be? 
So that's a great question and very relevant to thinking. So as I said, a lot of people will say that um, some inequalities are perfectly legitimate because they came about as a result of the different choices that people made. And I haven't said anything about that, and nothing here yet has spoken to this, right? Because it's possible that our view of procedural fairness is compatible with people making different choices. In a moment, I'm going to say something about why I think the choice perspective doesn't have a lot to do with K-12 education. Mm -hmm but I'll come to that in a minute. But I think choice is definitely, when we think about, that's like my students, I think that you know they have different talent and they work, some of them work really hard and some go off like on vacation on the weekend when they're supposed to be writing the paper. And you know, so you could say, well, I deserve the B grade because they didn't do any work. And at Stanford, you could have done any work. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, you're. Correct to assume you're, you're sort of just, uh, assuming an objective eye in assessing these these forms of inequality um, in, in the sense that depending on whether I'm a victim or a benefactor, I, I could really read these very yeah. differently, uh, and you know I could problematize your objective grounds mm -hmm. for procedural fairness or or re reify your. Right. On the up or the downside of them. Yeah, I think that's a great point. So what I would say is this is these like criteria, like they're they're conversation openers. So one of the things <coughs> we do in society is we argue about is this kind of inequality, right, so serious that it threatens right equal political standing. And then people argue about it. And is does this kind of inequality undermine procedural fairness of our institutions and people argue about it and so really this is i haven't answered like how do you set these things i've just said these are the things that people are arguing about so if you were going to argue with me on the procedural fairness part we might have different views but you would be trying to show me no it is fair and i would be trying to show you it's not fair but we would agree that if we could show that it was procedurally unfair, we would have a reason to object to the inequality. So, but you're right that part of the disagreements that go on in society is that people, say, you know, respond to these things very differently. Some people think, "What are you talking about? It's perfectly fair, right?" I mean, uh, every so one view of fairness. Well, this will lead me to my next. Um, you know, one view of fairness is, as long as the door is not slammed in their face, as the, long as there are no laws preventing children, you know, we know that 2% of the kids from poor families can get to hard right? That proves it's possible. So that says the system is fair. Because the idea of fairness that's at work here is, there's no formal barrier stopping you. And then some people will say, well, that can't be the right idea of fairness. That's not the idea. And then you are. Um, so I'm going to say a little bit about why that idea isn't the right idea. OK. So because I want to get um, to education. So so <clears throat> in the um, debates about education and equality in education, the dominant idea of equality has been equality of opportunity. It hasn't been equality of outcome, and that's probably for a good reason, which is children differ as adults differ, both in their aptitude and in their interests. And it doesn't make sense to demand that every child excel to the same extent in the same subjects as every other child. And so there are reasons to think equality of outcome is an unrealistic standard when you're dealing with kids who are different in lots of different ways. So the usual way people think about equality in the context of education is to think about equality of opportunity. And one idea of equality of opportunity that's um, often dominant and it's connected to the idea of procedural fairness is, as I said, a principle of non-discrimination. Just no formal barriers 
right? Everybody has a chance. It's not quite a coin <coughs> flip. But as long as there's nobody stopping you, right? Just go as far as you can. So there are a bunch of reasons why we should not accept the non-discrimination principle in education as our equality principle, and they're, I think, pretty obvious. And one of them relates to the choice issue. Um, uh, young children are not in a position to make <coughs> choices about their education. We force kids to go to school. We don't just give them the opportunity to go to school. And we expect as a society we have interest in them learning certain things whether or not they want to learn it. Now this isn't, forget high school, let's think about like K8. I don't know what the right cutoff is. But in K8, right, we're not interested in giving kids opportunities to learn. We're interested in their learning. Right? Society has an interest in their learning certain things, not simply they're being given the opportunity to do so. So a principle of non-discrimination, that's not enough, right? You actually have to make sure these kids achieve to some level of outcome. So that's the first reason why simple non-discrimination is inadequate for a democracy as a principle of education, for our, if we're going to have that as our equality of opportunity principle. And the second reason, but this is something that people will debate about, goes back um, to a very nice uh, essay by the philosopher uh, Bernard Williams, who is uh, imagining a society. So it's a society where there has been privilege and privilege hoarding by the very elites. It's a society where some people are knights and everybody else by law has not been allowed to be a knight. And so in the nights, they have the best diets, they uh, ride around on the horses, they learn all these skills. And then one day the society says, okay, we've had a law that says most of you can't be a knight. Today, anybody can be a knight. We remove the formal barriers. It's an equal society. Well, what happens? Well, it turns out the knights took all the good food, and they give all the good food to their kids. And the kids of the people who've never been knights, they're really poor and starving. So they can't, like, they're not even strong enough to get up on the horse. They can't ride. They, nobody ever gave them a horseback riding lesson. So now when they have the competition of who's going to get to be knights and the society that's removed the formal barriers, it turns out, right, the kids of the knights get to stay the nights, right? And so what Williams does is he says, look, that shows it can't be right to have an equality of opportunity principle, right? That's indifferent to the starting positions of people. It can't be, right, that we say that we have an equality of opportunity principle if some people never have the chance, right? We don't have equal opportunity to be a knight, if some people never have a chance of being a knight. And so whatever our equality of opportunity principle is, it's got to be more substantive than just removing the formal barriers. And then that opens the question, right, if you think that can't be what procedural fairness means, it can't be that we have procedural fairness in our institutions, if basically the game is rigged in such a way that most of the people never have a, now again, this gets close, but how much of a shot do they need, right? I, you know, Bernard Williams and I now have stacked the deck by saying, well, none of them get to be knights. But let's suppose that like every once in a while, one of these kids is born with a kind of body where you don't need a lot of calories. And so they're able to convert their very few calories into being able to ride horses and throw a, you know, is that going to be enough? Right? And then people are going to argue about what is the criteria. So now I'm going to try to enrich the criteria more. Anybody questions? Or? Okay. So, um, and this brings me to Rawls, who, brought, who, who said this, goes with the stability point. 
Okay, so Rawls actually um, is a philosopher who uh, wrote a lot about equality. And he rejects formal <coughs> equality of opportunity, what he sometimes calls, um, uh, yeah, the, the, just, sometimes he calls it the system of natural liberty. It's no formal barriers. He says that's inadequate for a principle of equality in a democracy because mere formal equality of opportunity will have status differentials between people where birth determines position. It can lead to a system of domination, undermine procedural fairness, and the rest. So he says we need a stronger equality principle if we're concerned about these um, in the context in particular of education, although he's not only concerned about education. And so he writes, and this is now the puzzle I want to have you talk about. Let's see, here's his statement. So he says, here's his statement. He calls this fair equality of opportunity. How many people know this principle? Okay, so everybody should know this. This is a really interesting principle. But, um, and it'll sound familiar to you once you hear it. So here's, the, here's Rawls's version of what equality of opportunity should mean. He says, those who have the same level of talent and ability and the same willingness to use them should have the same prospects of success regardless of their initial place in the social system. So think about it. Same level of talent and ability, same willingness to use them, regardless of their initial place in the social system. And Rawls, in particular, is thinking about social class here. So, and we'll talk about how that's not adequate. Right. So, regardless of your place in the class system, same talent, same ability to generate same outcome. That's the test of equality of opportunity. So how would you know? So here would be the one way you know. You take two people, one from the top quintile, one from the bottom quintile. Let's say you knew they have the same talent and ability and the same desire to use them. They should have the same outcomes. So the quintile that they're born into should not determine their life chances. Everybody's very kind of I mean, there's a lot of very attractive uh, Actually, what, you just, what, yeah. what you just said, though, um, the quintile they're born into should not influence their life chances, that doesn't follow from the actual standard. And actually, maybe a conflict with the actual standard, right? Because it could be that even under his standard, we're, the situation we're born into very much will influence your life chances by influencing the level of talent and ability you have and your ah. use of it. Okay, so that isn't part of the role story yet. Okay. That's a complication. That's why I said, if you, so if you could take those as fixed, that's a, you know, exactly right. If you could take those as fixed, so what Rawls is saying is, imagine, right, you could take as fixed talent and ability and willingness to use them, right, then your prospects of success in life should be the same regardless of the social class that you're born into. So that is the statement of the principle. Now we come to a, I think, a, you know, an important point that you just raised, which is Rawls is holding fixed here, talent and ability and willingness to use them. But of course, when you're talking about children and about education and about parents and about income and class. You're talking about factors that influence the level of talent and ability and the willingness to use them, right? And so it could turn out, like, I mean, this would be a, not, this is not Rawls' intention, right? Rawls is actually designing this principle for a just society. So he's not designing it to be implemented right now in our society, but it could turn out, supposing it's the case that girls are socialized never to want to try to be doctors, right? Only boys are socialized to want to be doctors. So it could be true, right? Similar talent and abilities and similar um, uh, 
um, willingness to use them, but girls aren't willing to use their talent and ability. They're never interested in being doctors. The principal could be satisfied, even though we have reason to object to the way boys and girls' motivations are shaped. Okay, so that's an important, so what Rawls says is a, you know, incomplete or misleading or, you know, needs more work because he hasn't looked at and wasn't intended to look at because he wasn't designing this for a society like ours, what happens when poverty shapes ambition and talent levels that people achieve, which we know, right? The more that poverty does that, and the more it does it in particular, not through just depriving people of resources. See, if it just deprives people of resources, then this principle is fine. Because you should have the same prospects whether or not you have the same resources, right? what quintile you're in. But what if what poverty does is it shapes people differently in terms of talent, the kinds of talents they are able to actualize, and in terms of their level of ambition. Right? Then we need some other corrective or something else to say about that. And in particular, we have to talk about the family. And Rawls um, himself, you just say, was very ambivalent. So at one place in um, his uh, in theory of justice, he says, we can never have true equality of opportunity once, as long as there's the family, because families will shape kids in different ways. And so we'll never be able to, you know, the talent and ability and motivation shaping factors of the family will interfere with that print, the operation of this principle. And at yet other places, he says, well, um, sometimes there'll be differences in people because of their families, but we'll have equality of opportunity as long as within s between sectors, on average, you get the same outcome. So imagine, this would be another way of thinking about the Rawlsian point, would be, okay, there's different shaping, but on average we should want the kids, the curves to look the same for the kids in the low income groups and the high income groups. So it'll be some kids in the low income groups will be very ambitious, some will be shaped to be non ambitious, some kids in the high income groups will be non ambitious, some will be shaped, but we shouldn't see a difference in the shape of the curves. Yeah. And, and why would one assume that there are no genetic differences between those groups? So Rawls doesn't talk about that at all. So, I mean, again, this gets to the, what are the arguments that people make when they're arguing about <coughs> acceptability of equal, you know, different forms of unequal outcome. One thing people will say is, well, maybe there are genetic differences that are explaining the, you know, levels of talent that people can, and then the other side has to come back, and this is one of the data points about, well, what, what, what do we know about that? Yeah. If you, I mean, just to, to add on, and if you have, I mean, put race and all that aside, if you have a, if you actually have procedural fairness in this sort of fair society at point one, I mean, it would seem that the presumption actually would be that there would be genetic differences between those who do well and those who don't. And then there's an argument about how big they are, but yeah. it would actually be odd that if you had these big achievement differences, but there are no genetic differences that correspond with that. Right, so, well, partly it depends on how the, this gets to the stakes, you know, and also the reward and, like, how the positions are thought of in society, whether they line up in a single line. Um, so you could think about diversifying the kind of positions and talents that people could achieve. But, you know, this isn't the only, I should say, these aren't the only principles, and equality isn't the only principle at work, so you might have reasons to think a fully meritocratic society wouldn't be such a good society. <coughs> and you might worry that a fully meritocratic society, if there really were genetic differences between people that then tended to, you know, lead to the genetically, you know, high-performing people on the top and the, you know, you might worry about the status arguments, and you might want to do some things to 
mitigate that. Yeah. So we're, we're focusing on the familial individual part with the neighbors, <coughs> but I want to go back to your part about the talent because one could argue that talent, that the notion of talent or the definition of talent is socially constructed, particularly the indicators or proxies we use for talent. That's socially constructed and that is also determined by resources. So for example, we use a lot in this society test scores as an indication of talent. Right? The test scores are heavily determined by resources whether you can manipulate those through test taking, prep store, through tutors, through having a really high quality school context as opposed to one that's not. So how is it the case that resources wouldn't matter to talent if you presume that two students have the different quintiles? Is it, I imagine if there's like raw talent, something that we could objectively measure that is not resource dependent, but what we use is resource dependent. Right, so, so the, the what, so Rawls's account is very general here. He's mm -hmm. not thinking about what you might call the endogeneity of talent production, right? I mean, he's thinking about it to some extent because he's worried that right, the quintile, the class quintile, that shouldn't be affecting, right, the things that people are able to be and do on the basis of the potential, talent potential they have. But there are all other kinds of things that go along with being in different quintiles that may affect what people can be and do. And he hasn't really helped us think about what those are. He said one thing, which is he thinks social class is an objectionable, you know, so you wouldn't want to observe, leaving aside Rick's complication about how do we think about genetics and genetic differences, you wouldn't want it to be the case that there's a difference simply on the basis of wealth differential between the shape of the curves of groups, right? The group of the bottom quintile and the group, you'll expect variation in each group. Right? And the variation should look more or less the same. That's the uh, Rawlsian principle. But then we get into all the complicating factors, and we also get into the complicating factor that it's not only income that shapes um, motivation and uh, uh, talent development. There are many other kinds of inequalities in society that can have that effect or differences, and not all of them are objectionable. And then this gets into not every inequality is objectionable. So there might be some ways, like uh, you know, some you know religious views, where people tell their you know try to socialize their kids not to be very materialistic, and you know don't be a high flyer, don't try to stand out, you know just like live a decent life. And that kid who's socialized in that way, and kids who come from that kind of group are going to achieve differently, let's assume, they don't rebel against their parents, they listen to their parents, than somebody who you know, says to their kid, like, go for the gold. Um, so that, but we might think that's not, a, you know, is, that's not a, a difference we should be concerned about unless the kid is so disadvantaged by following the parents, you know, or listening to the parents here, that they're not full members of the society that all these other values are undermined. Yeah. Yeah, when he go, it's a very interesting exercise, because he's trying to say that uh, differences in talent, let's say, shouldn't, uh, shouldn't be affected by social class. But would, 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 would he accept a corollary that, that says, Differences in the social class should not lead to differences in talent. Um, so again, it depends on the mechanism. So I think what Rawls is clear about, the clearest thing is that when the mechanism is just the possession of resources, right, that's objectionable, right? So think about like your social circumstance of, you know, did you grow up with a gold, a silver spoon in your mouth? That shouldn't lead to a different outcome from the kid just like you without the silver spoon. That I think is clear about. But now parents do a lot of other things with their kids besides put resources in them. They shape their kids in different ways. And some of those different ways are associated with different levels of income. But they're not the same. So you know, take the you know, now very over-discussed 
you know, who reads to their kids bedtime stories, and how much do they read? And supposing it turns out that wealthy families are just much more likely to spend time reading bedtime stories to their kids, and that has all kinds of downstream effects on the level of accountability. It's not obvious what Rawls has to say about that. Because it depends, you know, I think he would say things if it really turns out that this is, you know, leads to uh, unfairness in procedures or undermines, you know, status. We'd have to worry about it. But he cares a lot about what the mechanism is. So it's not just the production of the result, it's how the result is produced. That gets back to the, your comment about choices. Right, so sometimes the if the mechanism that's producing a, a, a differential outcome of the, let's take adults, is that adults make different choices of what to do with their lives. <coughs> Rawls doesn't necessarily have anything to say about that. Now, we, of course, we're not dealing with adults, we're dealing with kids, and so we have to pull it back. But I don't think he has a clear answer on what if the mechanism is the reading of bedtime stories. Yeah, because that might be like the teaching your kids not to be that materialistic versus. So I mean, it's real. So one uh, just point to make about this is, in the Rawls type approach, you have to think about what are the barriers or obstacles you think are illegitimate. <coughs> so he says it's social class. Social class should. Um, that's the thing we should be. We shouldn't see differences in people because of their the quintile that they're born into. But you might think that's not enough. We shouldn't see differences in people because of the gender that they have. We shouldn't see differences in people because of the in the U.S. because of the racial or ethnic group that they're part. You know, so we might have other factors, and then we would have to think about how do we deal with the family. And as I said, he's ambivalent. Because he one, at one point says, if, if the family is the producer of the inequality, not just in virtue of the wealth, but in virtue of the other things that rich and poor people do, like we, who reads more stories, then he, at one point he says, well, then there's no, any, there's no equality of opportunity, and we have to, and then he says, should we dismantle the family then? He says, this is a question, because it's a barrier. And then in another place, he says, no, there's perfect equality of opportunity, even if the family is differently socializing, as long as it's the case that between groups, roughly you get the same shape of the curve. Yeah, Ken, and I'm going to check the time. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, I guess I'm confused. Um, so, I mean, the principle of sounds very incomplete if you don't talk about the difference principle as being like, the other thing that is addressing those those kind of so I'm just wondering why. Right. So uh, this isn't the only principle in Rawls. Uh, we want to get a lecture exactly on Rawls. So, uh, but I'll mention Rawls has another principle he puts into play. So there's the principle I just read, the fair equality of opportunity principle. But then he also says inequalities in the society have to work to the benefit of the least advantaged. <coughs> which means you, when you're introducing an inequality, once, even if you have the fairness principle in place, you have to ask, is that inequality really necessary to improve the position of the worst off? And so that's a, another barrier on um, how, how low people will fall and how much inequality will come. He has other principles that also constrain <coughs> the amount of inequality. This is the only principle. But it's an interesting principle. So if you're thinking about equality of opportunity in education, all right, so here we are, we're trying to think like, you know, here are these differences in outcome between rich and poor kids, black and white kids in the United States. Should we care about it? And why should we care about it? Well, here's some reasons we might care about it. But well, what would it mean? How would you know when you had achieved what you want? Well, one way you could say you've achieved what you want is you have equal outcome for every kid. Well, that's not a realistic goal. You could think you have achieved what you want when you've just removed all barriers. Well, that's <coughs> an adequate. So then the question is, well, okay, what? how do we know 
when now you could have you know people try to say well I don't know this is all really complicated all that we should do is like let's just uh, you know there's a the, the phrase is a dollar a scholar let's just have equal resources let's just give uh, you know that's like the equal benefit principle let's just give equal dollars to each kid but of course there are all kinds of problems with that principle as a principle um, it, for a society in particular that dollars buy different things in different places and that very poor kids need more resources than rich kids to achieve the same kinds of benefits from education. So the dollar the scholar isn't a good um, marker. We try to do something along the Rawlsian line when we look at things like the race achievement gap and the, now the income achievement gap that's an attempt. You're not looking at each individual student. You're just saying across this broad category, the top 20% or the bottom 20%, we ought to see more or less the same distribution. And then, of course, you have the <coughs> question that Rick asked, where people will say, but wait a second, why are you assuming that there are no genetic differences between these groups? What if there are genetic differences that are explaining the outcome? And then you have to come back and give some evidence and data for why you think that can't be the primary or, or is a primary explainer. Now you might worry, even if, that's why I said pure meritocracy might not be a good principle anyway. You wouldn't want to live in a fully meritocratic society. There are lots of reasons. You know, you don't want to be dominated by the talent. You feel like being in university all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, you said it, I think, twice now, that um, equal outcome is not the only thing. But um, why isn't it? And I mean, I, if, I, if I think about, from the perspective of the teacher, so if they, if I'm thinking about the perspective of the teacher, I actually think that if all my students get A, and they are not because of big inflation, but really because they work towards it. I'm the best teacher that could be. Mm -hmm. um, and it also seems to me that the gap in outcome is much wider than the gap in opportunity, mm -hmm. which then is. Okay. <laughs> So, a, a good challenge. Um, uh, so why do I think equal outcome for all students is not a realistic goal? I guess I think they're just some, so first, as I said, kids differ in their interests, right? So, and you could say a good teacher can do a lot, but a good teacher can't take a kid, I'll take my, my son, I will give this <laughs> an example, an N of one. Yeah, so he's like a math whiz. But he's just not that interested in writing. And we've done lots of study. He's had great teachers. It's just not his thing. Like, you get him a lot. He'll be like there with a you know, math book. Like, that's his idea of fun. And his idea of fun is not meaning at all. It's just, and he's been like this since he was four. So. I don't think, you know, asking him to achieve on the same level as a kid who loves literature, I mean, like, that's, it doesn't seem like that's a realistic, and I actually think asking kids who don't like math to achieve on his level isn't that realistic. Um, partly because of their interest, partly because he may just, that may be what he's really good at. So Unless, unless you realize that if a kid doesn't achieve in math, maybe that's not a novel, but mm -hmm. if the kid doesn't achieve in math, um, it keeps him or her from continuing on the path. Uh, so there are two down. Right. So I'm. So there are a couple of things. So let's just keep um, somewhat separate. So achieving it to a certain threshold, right? Could almost all children achieve to a certain threshold 
you know, there'll be some kids who can't because of various, um, uh, you know, disabilities to, that they have. But I think all kids could achieve to a certain threshold. So you could have an equality on that threshold, and it could be a pretty high, like, well, I don't know. Some people don't think this. I'm not a policy person, so I don't know what the realistic, um, you know, could everybody have the capacity to go to college? You know, could most kids, you know, with the exception of the few kids who just can't benefit that much from education, is that a realistic standard? Supposing that maybe that is a realistic standard that every kid could achieve enough so that they could be eligible to go to college whether or not they wanted to go. There's still going to be differences above that, even that very high threshold. And so trying to get very, very equal, you would either have to, and this actually and this is a good way of segueing into closing this is, you know, there could be trade-offs that you then have to think about. So here's a, you know, trade-off. Maybe some kids, you know, this is what Stanford does, right? Stanford thinks we get these really talented kids right here and we hothouse them. We're not a, we don't take everybody who wants to buy. We're a hothouse because we think by hothousing Right, really talented kids, we can achieve some things with these kids and we can teach in ways that we couldn't otherwise. And that could happen earlier than college. So like some math classes could be the hot houses of that time. Well then, then you have a question, where do you put your resources in the schools? Right? So you want to bring everybody up to that threshold level. I think that's the most important thing. I accept that as a fundamental like you goal for democracy. But then above that, there are going to be some trade-offs because you could distribute equally all the resources, but then you won't have, have, have money to have house. Then there's set, so there's one trade-off of do you not hot house some kids? Do you really try to get everybody on the same outcome level? Or do you lose something by doing that? And then there are other questions about um, about trade-offs above the, at that very high level. Um, so, but so it, wh another one is when we haven't talked about this. How do we think about private resources versus public resources? So, whatever principle you accept for schools, and let's say you're very egalitarian principle for schools, as long as the society has a lot of differential private resources, we know parents will put in more money. No school, I think, has the ability to keep up with what the very wealthiest parents could do. Now that may say that that background of having very, very wealthy parents who could do this undermines all these things, but given that background, then you're going to have to deal with how do you think about <coughs> private resources versus public resources. Do you try to um, tag your public resources to private resources? So if you know parents are doing this, do you at least try to like, keep the public resources high enough so these kids can compete with the people pouring in money? Do you, you know, hope that the private resources go to yachts instead of into their kids' education, even though you know, we may love education, but on the other hand, there's some bad side consequences of people, which people putting so much money into their kids' education as opposed to yachts. Do you think, no, let the rich people put all their money into their kids' education because there are some other benefits you get um, as long as you can tax, you know, a transfer, um, and so you set up social institutions to capture some of those benefits, and so it's fine to have these inequalities. So I, I do think, though, that at some level, there are going to be trade-off questions. And partly, again, that depends on what's the basis of your objection to the inequality. Yeah? I guess I would ask, like, could we characterize the principle from law as something like trading position? Because, like, I wish I could be someone else <coughs> holding constant sometime and it takes for some things because I think in the example that you put like a kid that is has grown up not to love money so much mm -hmm. you know, I, I I mean it seems to me in a way weird to rank like value the value for money and 
I will, I will think of it as if he would like to be doing what he values and he's done someone else. And so right. so the, the thing, I think that's a complication for roles is, you know, families do a lot of things to kids. They give them resources and so that, and that can make a huge difference on what people, and, and some of the resources are just financial resources. So big problem in our country is that college is not accessible to people because it's not affordable, right? That's just a function of the resources, the financial resources that are in reach for really poor people. So one thing families do is they make it possible for some kids to afford college and some kids can't. But they do other things to kids. They shape them to be the kind of people they are. And that has effects on the development of their potential. And that's true even schools can do some things. We know schools can do some things to mitigate the effects of families and counteract the effects or work with the effects. But and society can do things to change the stakes that attach to those effects so that you know, you're not so much rewarding the pushy middle class parents who try to get their kids to get every advantage. But parents also shape, you know, help shape kids as to who they are. And part of who you become means that you'll have different life options open to you as a result of who you become. Who you become. And not all those shaping influences are objectionable. So then you have to basically think about what are the shaping influences, what are the kinds of barriers that these differences pose that are objectionable and which aren't. Yeah. Just because the problem that refers around to a question about the roles in camera. The, the, the first is about that idea of um, some differences not being objectionable. Um, you mentioned that you know, so some families may choose to read to their children more frequently than others, but that well, on the surface, it may just appear to be a familiar difference, but it could also be underlying proximity to a library or the financial resources of the leisure time to read. Um, a second point might be that the familiar differences um, are not socially recognized. So instead of reading to your kid, you might tell family stories that develop the child in another way, but the outcome measures are socially constructed, particularly uh, you know, standardized tests or whatever you choose. And so it leads me to the question of whether the roles in framework for um, considering inequality is something that you think we're constructing from first principles, or whether that itself is a kind of subconsciously socially accepted framework for understanding inequality, and if so, that can be changeable. So, um, okay. So I take your point that um, the ability to read or not to read for your kids could be implicated in all, you know, in, in like the amount of resources you have, the amount of time you have. So it's not resource neutral. But there are some things that families do to their kids that aren't themselves automatically a result of the amount of income and wealth those families have. So again, some families have religious convictions. Now, there are a lot of things to say about children. Right? So, you know, we don't want children only, like, create, they're not, their, they, they're not owned by their parents, right? They're independent, autonomous beings, and they need to develop as independent, autonomous beings. But good families is going to be shaping effects of the parents' values on the kids to some, to some extent. Schools and other Places are going to try to develop in kids the ability to be critical of the you know values, think about you know uh, the lives they lead, and at least you know to not follow blindly or serve, be servile. But they're going to be shaped by their parents to some extent, and then the question is which kinds of shaping are objectionable. So we have and. Here I do think, so you said social destruction, I think we have sociological reasons to be worried about some kinds of shapings that are connected to certain differences in society that have been markers of unequal status and systems of domination. So this is kind of, I mean, it basically says the equality of opportunity principle is designed to address, the Rawlsian principle, could be designed to address certain kinds of differences in society, not every difference. He picked out class 
because that's the one he thought was the kind of key, and also because he thought even in a just society, you were going to have differences in economic class because there would be different kinds of positions with different kinds of rewards. He thought the other differences, like the racial and gender, he thought those like would just go away, so he didn't really address them. In our society, those are huge problems. So we can say, no, we actually want to use this kind of framework to address systematic differences that have been the basis of unequal status and domination and unfair procedure, undermined procedural fairness and so on. So we can use it that way. The fact that it's socially constructed isn't really what's, I mean, what's important. What's important is that the inequalities produce these spillover effects that we have reasons to care about. Not all inequalities, and including not all, in, you know, here's another, like rural versus urban. There are huge differences um, in what happens to kids who grow up on farms versus, you know, I grew up in the Bronx. I, you know, so many things that were not open to me, like growing up, you know, things I couldn't do and be, and for a kid growing up in the Bronx, and I was shaped in ways, I just, I can't undo those. You know, I would have been a different person, I think, if I had grown up in a, you know, on a farm. And so then the question is, well, that probably shaped some of who I became and what I care about and what my interests were. And is that objection? Well, it can't, and it can't be that everything that shapes us to be who we are is objectionable. So we need some criteria for thinking. When are the things that are shaping us in certain ways ones we should care about, and when are they not? And one suggestion is, well, when they, you know, lead to status inequalities or domination, that's a reason to care. But like, turned out city kids dominate. Maybe they do. Um, you know, if your life prospects of growing, or if your life prospects are so bad, so there's a humanitarian reason to care, or a threshold reason. You got to get everybody over. A, pretty high threshold, I think. Um, and then the question is, what do you do over the threshold? If you had a, you'll be the I last. I do have a question. Yeah. Previous would permit it. Yeah. be the last word. Permit it. So no, this is a great discussion. I'm glad I, I came and left my own children at home to fit for themselves. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then having different personalities, they'll probably all choose different things to do. Um, but so here's the question I'm wondering. So we're focusing on this, this really hard problem of the fact that families shape personalities and talents and all of that, and we can't plausibly have a, an equality of opportunity idea that we're holding the hate family, and so how do you figure out what violates equality of opportunity and what doesn't? And that's a really important question. Um, but in our society, I think there are a lot of questions that we have to confront before we even get to that one. Mm -hmm. So if you look, for example, at the, um, you know, the pool of high-achieving high school students, very high achieving, who could be at places like Stanford. You know, the ratio of high income to low income kids in that pool is three to one, say. At places like Stanford, it's 15 to one, right? So there's, that's presumably a violation of mm -hmm. some principle. This is holding steady uh, scores and grades and all that stuff, right? So then the question is, um, if that's true across the nation, at elite schools like Stanford, top 20, 30, 50, 100 schools, the proportion of high income students to low income students is way out of whack with their proportion in the actual population. What do we do? Um, would it be permissible, morally permissible at least, to have a law that required universities to make sure that low income students are represented in their pools, equivalent to low income students' representation in the population? You know, holding achievement constant. Or would it be morally permissible for an institution like Stanford to say, this is our policy, right? We're not legally required to, but we think it's mo we have a moral uh, command mm -hmm. to have low-income, high-achieving students as well represented relative to the percentage of the population mm -hmm. as high-achieving, high-income students. I wouldn't want to be in Stanford's legal office considering this question, but you know, I think... Well, no, I don't know why it would be un why it wouldn't be legal, though, frankly. You're the lawyer. So <coughs> well, I mean, right. No, but, but put the but, law yeah, aside. Put the law aside. Morality. I think, if, you know, um, so could you say, look, um, 
we know, so one thing about the statistics of the high school and the college would be, so the Rawls principle is what similarly talented and motivated. So one issue is if kids in, which I think is some of the findings, is that poor kids don't want to go away to school. No, I'm just saying, I'm just saying let's, let's hold that. See I'm, let's hold that constant. Okay. <laughs> kids have the same preferences, the mm -hmm. same talent, the same okay, performance so they have level. The same, but so the ratio on the even if the ratio on the population is four to one, at elite colleges it's fifteen to one. From the top quintile to the bottom quintile. Yeah. Holding achievement. It would be a constant. great thing for college, for places like Stanford to um, uh, have a distribution, let's say by income. Uh, that that met the goal of Stanford to have high the high you know very high highest achieving mm -hmm. students, but was able to do it on the basis of um, uh, not of not having income count. Now there are all kinds of reasons probably why income counts, and then uh, so forget the legal office, and I, you know I'm sure there are tra again trade offs. So how do you think about if donors? The high income, let's say, more part of the reason is because donors who give a lot of money to Stanford allow Stanford to take in more students than they would be able to take in in the absence of those donors. So there are. But you don't accept their children, and they might not donate. Right. And then. Well, then we're going back. Then we're going back. But but then there might be a trade-off in a non-ideal world, right, where education is costly. Um, about what the size is of the groups that you can afford to educate at the very top schools. So, but I, I think it's a, um, uh, you know, from my perspective, uh, and from and from a Rawlsy perspective, I think the fact that only two to three percent of uh, the students at Stanford are from the very bottom. Quinto is not a good thing. Stanford has gotten a little bit better recently, so I don't know what the actual date is, but that's in general across the elites is so low is actually um, not acceptable. I just yeah. happened to see the data today. Mm -hmm. um, and low income is defined as uh, less than 100,000 a year. That's a that's so yeah. yeah. Stanford definition. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> And then there's something called very low income, which is below 80. Right. <laughs> and the national poverty level for a family of four is. Yes, exactly right. Thank you very much.